Culture or commerce? What's the state of techno today? I think that techno music pushes especially the pop music a lot. What influence does the genre have on the younger generation? And which DJs are putting their stamp on techno now? I would say these charts say a lot about our societies. And they don't say anything for me about the underground scene because that's like a parallel world happening. Techno is harder, faster and more diverse than ever. DJs like Kobusil from Berlin are celebrated as stars. There's that concept of business tech men, right? And it's a multi-million dollar industry now, and a lot of the people who are very successful within the genre are flying around on private jets. And the idea of people coming together as like a form of communion, sort of non-hierarchical communion, I think in many ways has uh, changed. Club culture has a reputation for being colourful, open-minded and tolerant. Is that still the case? Especially within queer communities, there's a real kind of push for community-driven experiences. And I think that's a really, really wonderful thing. But I think when you start to move into the more mainstream capitalistic side of techno music, that's when that lack of authenticity starts to appear. So where is the hype happening? Before we look ahead, let's look back. In the early days of techno, it was a futuristic sound that got people moving on the dance floors of Detroit. A locally produced TV show played a decisive role in promoting the hippest sounds, dance moves and outfits. To go back and watch some of them and to see the outfits and see the dancing, it will always be extremely unique and that type of thing will never be repeated. It just won't. And the influence that that had on generations will always be. And so anyone to look at them even now, they'll look at it and go like, what? And see some of the moves and some of the things that people were doing it. Oh my gosh. Detroit sound is funky. I don't care what they say. I know they say it's the home of techno, and yes, techno was created there, but the house came first, then techno. When that type of music came to Germany, it landed first in record stores like Hard Wax in Berlin. But the term techno is said to have been coined in Frankfurt in the 1980s by DJ Tala to XLC. Back then, the West German banking capital was one of the centres of the techno movement, along with Berlin. Frankfurt boasted major events with well-known DJs like Sven Fett, one of the scene's first big stars. By the middle of the 1990s, techno was a mainstream phenomenon in Germany. Music has to be able to accommodate it. I think it's strong enough and it will keep going. If it's good, it will catch on. Techno is very active on the underground scene, just as it's blossoming on a commercial level. The lines between subculture and mainstream have long been blurred. For the 1996 Love Parade, the Berlin Club Tresor mounted a huge party, featuring round-the-clock DJ sets for three days and nights. Party till you drop was the motto. Everything that is happening in the in the club culture or like in, in underground music scenes are like very slowly coming to the mainstream. Techno continued to reach an ever-growing audience, and now, like every other musical genre, it's available on streaming platforms. What I see is that arrangements of the track, they they just become shorter because people want to listen to, to those tracks on Spotify or whatever so whatever platform they have. And um, what I also discover is that people want to have a pop arrangement in it. Pop and techno? Isn't that a contradiction in terms?
As a musician, Jan Wagner is more at home with classical music. As a sound designer, he worked for the label owned by the Berlin techno club Berghain. And as a producer, he mixes electronic music, techno and pop. He says the future lies in combining genres. Techno is anti-pop, and if you, if you combine them, this makes it special. In 2019, Wagner produced the song Rigid by the transmedia artist Rosa Anschutz. Switching on the highest drum, shadow and it's getting louder. It was special because she has her own style. And we were working with Kobuzil closely and uh, he decided to make a remix out of it because he heard the energy and the potential of the track too. Rosa Anschutz's pop and spoken word experiments were mixed with techno DJ Kobusil's driving dance beats. The mix of genres was considered a breakthrough in the scene. The track quickly went viral, being streamed millions of times. You have this power of, of a four on the floor beat um, compared to a softened soft vocal track. It was a huge success for both artists. I wasn't sure about what, what it meant for me because there was suddenly a big um, audience. Of course, I was also very um, happy about the remix. I mean, it touched many people, but um, I don't necessarily agree how this techno thing is um, being performed because in the end it is also a performance. And it made Kobazil a star. I think it was initial for artists and um, what we did is we just opened a gate. A choir backed with 138 beats per minute? Also possible these days. German DJ Bennett has remixed a famous song from a popular film soundtrack of his childhood. The song was composed by Bruno Couleur for The Chorus, a French film about a boarding school for troubled boys. Given the techno treatment, the track became a viral hit, landing in the top five of the German streaming charts. That could be the future of, I think, even pop music, because it is so anti-everything you have heard. DJs like Max Kobazil are now entrepreneurs who sell stylish fashion as luxury merchandise. Techno has expanded and developed and become a business model. I think the main difference now is that everything's got very expensive and it's therefore really difficult for, for people to take risks often. And you know that type of experimentation that is so vital to creativity um, becomes then sometimes just the preserve of people who, who are privileged enough to be able to um, take those risks, those financial risks. Techno is a lifestyle presented by major fashion magazines like Vogue with the message, be yourself, everything is allowed. The Gen Z generation is, I would say, is one of the first generations now who can really enjoy all those things that the earlier generations were really struggled with and fight for. And now they can play with their identity. They're more open to organize things or talk about things that were maybe taboo before. Luca Eck represents a young generation that wants to transcend boundaries. Their album, Quantum State, is about overcoming binary worldviews and about the chances and dangers of breaking new ground, including musically. 
My, is, My impression is that there are lots of new sound aesthetics, a lot of maybe micro styles. I think there's still a lot of like purists within the genre, but I th really reject that idea because I think techno has always been about doing something futuristic and pushing the boundaries. Many of the tracks were made together with Jan Wagner. Both musicians have their roots in classical music and experiment with different genres and musical elements to create something new. Techno gives you a structure and in this structure you can be free. And techno is so hard and so industrial and so anti-pop that people want to be different and want to be seen as different and individuals. The techno scene celebrates the underground while at the same time taking it mainstream. You represent yourself every minute on social media and the scene is becoming bigger and bigger. They want to show themselves, they want to, they want to wear those clothes they or originally have in the, in the dark rooms or something. And this is what they, what they wear now. Fetish wear has become the dress code of a young generation of TikTokers who encountered techno on social media, where they present the genre. Everything is staged for an audience, real or imagined, including their visits to clubs. I think there's been a lot of negative developments coming from the presence of social media within the community and the need for artists and for everything you do to be presented online. There are tutorials for the right dance moves and social media is even influencing music production. Everything has to be bigger, faster, harder, stronger. People watch these videos and sometimes I go to a party and everyone dances the same and that's so against the spirit of techno for me. Does the history of this musical style need to be told anew? The legend of techno as the sound of freedom started in the early 1990s, after the fall of the Berlin Wall. Clubs like Trezor popped up in disused or abandoned buildings in the formerly divided city, and clubbers could party out of bounds. We flew uh, weekly people in, from mainly from Detroit, also from the UK, but mainly from the US, and uh, it was such an excitement in the city. It was also for Berlin a big chance because many clubs started in those days, you know, on an illegal base, but it helped actually the musical development. Yeah, techno, had this yeah, techno just became the sound of the end, end of East Germany. Uh, that was the music and the places it was played, where the East and West Germans partied together. That is a very strong narrative, and a lot is left out that didn't fit into that. So much so that to this day many fans don't want to believe that techno isn't a German invention, but an intercultural phenomenon. It's a genre with tangled roots, using technical equipment made in Japan and electronic beats from Europe brought to dance floors by black American DJs. Hello, my friend. You know, welcome to the exhibition. One of the few surviving clubs from the early days of the Berlin techno movement is Trezor. The club marked its more than 30-year history in 2022 with a huge multimedia exhibition. I think the sort of um, sort of main framework was just kind of how to weave all of those different threads of the history together to form some sort of patchwork quilt that would result in various different events, you know. Nikki Byrne was the project manager behind the Trezor Anniversary Exhibition. She focuses on electronic music and has worked for several record labels. She wants more diversity, including female representation in the music industry. Ultimately, the music industry is like a microcosm of what else is reflected in society. So if you look at like Fortune 100 companies or you look just generally, there's still a lack of diversity, there's still a lack of representation. One, two, three, four. 
Only now are people starting to ask who did what when and who contributed in what way. The film Black to Techno revisits the history of the genre and highlights the women at the turntables. I don't care what it is. Every type of music happens because of some other type of music. Questioning accepted narratives is Anita Yori's job. The linguist and media studies scholar has been studying electronic music since the early 2000s, with a special focus on diversity. It's never one history. We are talking about thousands of different histories and stories, and that's how we silence out uh, people like the queer community or the female um, DJs and producers from that time, because there is no books or sources existing on their stories. So this is why I think it's now we are in this moment that we have to push you know, further their stories and not only always asking the same people what happened. Stacey Hotwax Hale is a house music DJ. The style is considered a forerunner of techno. Hale has spent some 40 years DJing, producing, teaching and creating radio shows. I think what is happening, that they're doing their homework and they're reaching out to, you know, since, so thank God, here's social media, because at the time that I was evolving, there was no social, it was a paper flyer, a text on a pager or in a phone call. Legendary house DJ Ken Collier was Hale's mentor in the 1980s. Stacey Hale was able to establish herself in Detroit as one of the few women DJs, and she helped to promote the city's music scene. This part of techno's history is only gradually being rediscovered. And only now is there interest in Berlin in discovering what has made Hale so successful on the other side of the Atlantic. And not just anywhere in Berlin, but in the city's most famous and infamous techno club, Berghain. The club with the notorious door policy is just as choosy when it comes to DJs. In order to stay on top, Berghain is banking on greater musical variety and diversity in its programming, including giving black artists and the house music scene a platform getting this opportunity to come here to represent. I'm so excited. But it was a long road before the scene opened itself up. We had to still kick down doors to make things happen. And we're just now, in this last decade, getting the recognition. It's not like we weren't there. What defines the spirit of techno? Is it the unifying power this music is so often said to have? And why is techno being experienced today as fresh and liberating by a new generation of artists and club goers, as seen here in the music video to a track by Luca Ek and Nur Yaba? It's, uh, it's energetic, it's deep, it's hypnotic, it, uh, it gives you the present moment feeling. So when, when you're listening to techno, you're fully in the present moment. Nur Yaba grew up in Lebanon. She belongs to a younger generation that discovered the techno scene in the 2010s. Where I felt most at home was uh, when I started partying a lot. <laughs> it took some time to get to, get to where I am now. To, to become a DJ. Making music is an important creative outlet for Yaba. She started writing her own compositions at 14 and deepened her knowledge while studying at Boston's Berkeley College of Music. Hard, fast, loud. Music as an antidote to the frightening memories of the 2006 war in Lebanon. 
When I was in Beirut, I didn't have time to think about these things because I was more on survival mode. But then when you come to a place where you feel like comfortable and safe, then these traumas start coming out. Beyond the fear, the hate, beyond the rule of order, beyond the race, the gender, we are one beyond borders. This is what techno gave me when I when I first came here and when I first discovered it uh, at Bergheim and uh, the parties around, I just felt that there was no more borders and that it was real at that moment. But there are stories from the legendary early days of the techno movement that are far less positive. In the many boxes stored in a back room of Berlin's archive of youth culture, its director, Daniel Schneider, also collects stories that don't seem to fit with the spirit of techno and that contradict the reputation of the early 1990s Berlin techno scene as being tolerant and open-minded. Um. Here we have an issue of Borsch magazine with a very long interview with Jeff Mills. As far as I know, it's the first time he expressed that he didn't support the narrative that everything was great and wonderful and everyone came together without discrimination. Rather, he did actually experience racism in the Berlin techno scene. In all the historical accounts of the techno scene, racism is rarely mentioned. And I've witnessed people who were active in the scene back then, the key players, even deny there was any racism. Artists still report experiencing racism, like Glasgow and London-based Talia. Despite the success of her debut album, she's still subject to discrimination. Becoming an artist made me more aware of it because, for example, like when I tell people that I am a music artist, they act surprised because they don't think someone like me could be a successful music artist. Or I'm playing somewhere and the boat sub won't let me in for some reason. Doesn't believe that I am the person who I say I am. The techno scene is meant to stand for pushing boundaries, being open-minded and diverse. Is that just a cliché? Electronic dance music culture is still, until today, is well known for being not the most diverse, uh, let's say, scene, but it's really changing. If we are talking about independent and underground scenes, they are way more diverse. Unlike the commercial mainstream, the underground still offers room for innovation, including artistically. Underground for me is a lot about experimentation and to have a space of mutual respect. It's just really encouraging to try out new things and to push the sound towards new spheres. There's also greater acknowledgement of the vital role queer people play in the scene. It empowers the people, whoever they are, whatever gender they have, whatever they feel like, just to be there and just to be an artist or a DJ. Clubs are really laboratories there, you know, this kind of experiments with different way of living a life or a different way of experiencing things happen. The queer club scene also inspired Talia to make electronic music and gave her the courage to come out as a trans woman. Today, she's an in-demand artist. I very much fell into my music career. And then I think when I started going out more or clubbing, that feeling of isolation dissipated as I met people similar to me. 
That's when I started to get really interested in it because I was like a product of my own environment. But Talia isn't just a sought-after DJ. She's also considered a role model. In terms of my career, that's all really that I've wanted to do is to not necessarily make myself visible, but to make my lived experience visible so people know that we exist and we do really, really great things, yeah. Especially if we talk about marginalised groups, for example, marginalised communities, a club for them is a refuge. Honey. is a place where they can really express themselves and they can experience their own identities and they can be the people who they really want to be. So only clubs accept them and only clubs as a space accept them as how they are. Techno still offers space for the innovative and unexpected. But will the genre really change the future of pop music? What do you think? Let us know in the comments.